Welcome back, and now we want to continue our review for the Unit 4 lecture exam in Introduction to Geology, and so now we want to talk about the geology of deserts. So make sure and read your lesson objectives to prepare you for the exam, and then make sure and read Chapter 17 out of your textbook. And then if you're interested, there is an Earth Revealed video on deserts. So, uh, you need to know what is a desert. And a desert is not defined by its temperature. So a desert is actually defined by the amount of moisture that it gets. So that, for example, you can have deserts at the North and the South Poles, places where it's extremely cold but yet it is actually considered to be a desert there because it doesn't get that much snowfall at the North and the South Poles. So you should be able to explain how deserts uh, can form. So under what conditions are you going to have very, very dry climates? So deserts are defined by dry climates where it doesn't have a lot of moisture. So what kinds of processes would produce air that is very, very dry? So in this case, it's going to be natural high pressure systems that uh, develop at 30 degrees latitude. And so we've already explained in our lesson on uh, climate uh, why uh, the uh, air uh, heats up at the equator, tries to go north, is blown off course because of the Coriolis effect and then it comes back down as a high pressure system. So I encourage you to go back to that series of videos on when we talked about climate in order to understand that. So all that you need to know for this exam is that at 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude, uh, air is naturally coming down to the Earth's surface that forms a high pressure system and that keeps clouds from forming so therefore at those latitudes you tend to have deserts. Okay, then you need to understand what a rain shadow is and uh, so how uh, does uh, moist air, why would it lose its moisture as it's climbing up over a mountain and then when it goes over the other side it's very very dry air. Okay, then we also talked about that uh, ocean currents can generate deserts. So that if you have cold ocean water, then that's going to rob the air above the water of its heat. And in order to have a cloud, you need to have moist, warm air. So moist, warm air will climb and then it will turn into a cloud and then it's going to rain. So if you've got cold air, cold air is not going to rise as much, so it, it can't uh, hold as much moisture, and so you tend to have deserts located to very, very cold oceans. Okay, then another thing is that the further a, uh, a cloud uh, travels over a continent, the more it's going to be losing its moisture and so eventually it's going to get to a point where it's not dropping any moisture at all and then that area is going to turn into a desert. And then uh, we mentioned that at the poles air is coming down. So air is coming down at plus 30 degrees and minus 30 degrees latitude. Air is also coming down at positive 90 degrees latitude and negative 90 degrees latitude, which corresponds to the North and the South Poles. So as that air is coming down, it doesn't keep clouds from uh, forming, uh, and so uh, the North and the South Poles uh, are actually considered to be deserts. Okay, so what is going to control the development of a desert landform? Okay, the amount of vegetation, because vegetation has roots and that helps to hold the soil in place. Okay, it depends on the load. 
uh, the amount of material that is being moved by uh, the wind. And uh, in a, uh, when we talked about a river, a river had material that was in solution, material that was suspended, and then material that was on the bed and was moving along the bottom of the river channel. So you'll notice that solution is missing from this particular thing. So it only talks about the suspended load and then the bed load. So that there is no materials that are in solution. There's no physical materials that are dissolved in the air. But things are suspended and things do move on the floor of the desert. Okay, then you have how hard is the wind blowing, how much moisture is in the air, and then what is the temperature like. So what are some different types of desert weathering? So remember there's always physical weathering that breaks rocks down into smaller pieces but doesn't change them chemically. And then you have chemical weathering which does change those rocks chemically. So as far as physical weathering is concerned, water is the primary thing that sculpts deserts. It's not going to be the wind. So the primary thing that is going to cause landforms in a desert is actually going to be water erosion from flash floods. Okay, but then wind is also very important. Another example is thermal expansion and then ice wedging, but you wouldn't tend to have ice wedging in a desert that's very, very hot. So you would need to, ice wedging, you have to have places where the temperature is going to drop below the freezing point of water in order for that process to occur. Okay, then you had different kinds of chemical weathering. So oxidation uh, is rusting, and so that's why in the deserts uh, you notice there's a lot of red colors, and that's where it's coming from. Uh, hydrolysis is going to be minerals mixing with water, and that tends to make clays. And then dissolution is as groundwater percolates through the soil, it can dissolve calcium carbonate and carry it down to lower parts of the soil where it then reforms. Okay, then, um, so how does erosion happen in a desert? So we said that water is going to be the primary thing that is going to cause erosion, so flash floods. And then ephemeral streams, so if you recall, when we talked about groundwater, we talked about disappearing streams. And that was a stream that flows on top of the ground until it encounters a crack or something where that water can get into the water table underneath the ground. So the same thing can happen in a desert where you have a river and it just disappears. But we call these things ephemeral streams. Okay, then you could also have erosion caused by the wind. And uh, this is, uh, you can have the impact of the wind itself, which really doesn't cause that much erosion. But if you have the impact of the wind and it has dust and sand and pebbles in it, then it's much better for erosional purposes. But the reason why I included the impact of the wind itself is because I wanted to show you that this is very similar to what a river does. A river can erode just by the impact of the water. It can erode because of the impact that is in suspension. And then it can erode because of the impact that is in the bed load. So notice that here I did it in the same order, but wind is not a very good eroder uh, just by itself. It needs to be carrying something in order to erode. And then a river can also transport and so can wind. So the material can be transported in the form of suspension, uh, in the form of saltation, uh, in the form of creep, and then a special 
uh, example of suspension is going to be dust storms, where the dust is suspended uh, in the air. And then, uh, again, I wanted to show you that uh, we had in the, our lesson on rivers, we had a graph where we had the velocity of the water, and then we had the uh, size of the material that was being carried uh, in the river, and then we found that it broke it up into three different areas. So you had, uh, under conditions of very high velocity, you had erosion. Under conditions of very low velocity, then you had deposition. And then in between was transport. So you'll notice that in this graph here, you have a very similar situation when it comes to the wind. So uh, whether a desert is uh, eroding material or transporting material, or depositing material is going to depend on the velocity of the wind and then what is the size of the particle that it's trying to move. Okay, let's take a break and when we come back we will talk about what are some desert landforms.